you have three principles. When you say principles, do you mean you have to educate me? Do you mean partners or? Uh, I have two other partners, yeah, okay. yes. Okay, and, and? They do, they do uh, a separate part of the business. They, they do the contracting part of it for rental agreements and things like that, and I handle all the repairs and maintenance. So you're, in essence, the COO, you do the operations uh, part of it? I'm the president of the company, yeah. but yes, I, okay. I handle all the operations. Okay. Um, and how long has your second in command been working with um, the company? Uh, since February. Okay. Um, and since February, is it a he or a she? It's my brother, yes. Your brother. Yes. He's, he's not been able to come. No. He's, yes. <laughs> and how many contracts do you have coming up? Uh, I signed two contracts over the weekend, and I'm actually preparing estimates for two more. Okay. Uh, let's talk specifically about these contracts. When does the work begin? Do you have a contract that you're currently doing work on right now? I've got three that I'm currently doing work on right now. Okay. And... and um, what are the nature of these jobs, these contracts? They're um, complete renovation, complete painting of townhomes. And so I've got a flooring job that I've got a flooring crew in. And I've got another job that's a painting job that we're supposed to start on tomorrow. Now, on a, when you say we're supposed to start on tomorrow, on a day-to-day -day basis when your company, when you do these jobs, are you actually out on the site? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so you're running the operations on the site of the crew, as it were. Yes, I left here yesterday and actually did maintenance on two properties. And then this morning I was already at two properties getting the crew set up and giving them their daily, what they needed to have done by the end of the day. And if you're not there, what happens? It doesn't get done. And what happens if it doesn't get done? I lose money. Is that the only response that you've changed since last week? or yesterday, rather? Uh, yes, that was an answer to two of the questions when the judge said, did something change, and then would it be financially hazardous? You indicated also that you recognized someone else in the general pool. That, was I correct when I noticed yes, that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, do you remember that person's number? Uh, no. Okay. No. Do you know where you recognize that person from? He was my chiropractor several years ago. Does y'all have a close relationship, or did you see him when you went to see the chiropractor? It was close when he was working on my back, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> um, is there anything about that relationship that, that developed while he was working on your back? Is there anything that it, about that relationship that developed while he was working on your back that would um, interfere with your ability to? Um, arrive at conclusions and decisions on your own, and both of you all were selected to sit no. on the jury? No, not okay. at all. You've also seen some publicity about this case as well? A little bit, yes. Okay, can you tell us uh, what you've seen? Um, it's been, I, I would guess it was, it's been months, um, but I guess it was during the other, the other gentleman's trial. Uh, I don't know what the details. I, didn't, I never paid attention to it, really. It wasn't, wasn't something I, I follow. Have you heard the name Andrew Schneiderman before? Yes. OK. And when did you hear that name? During the, during the trial. OK. Do you remember what context and which context it was brought up or what the person may have said when you heard the name? Uh, that it was her husband that was killed and either the gentleman that, that was convicted of, I guess he was convicted of the killing uh, was involved with her somehow. Okay. Did you hear the details of, of, of that involvement? In other words, was that involvement ever characterized um, in the media? Uh, I, he either worked for her or worked at the same company or whatever, and I, I guess it's GE from the survey that we took. So. Okay. In your response to um, question number 54, you said um, he was shown as being obsessed with the man's wife. Yes. Um, I and then you say what you just said, I think the man uh, may have worked, I think they may have worked together, essentially. Yes. Um, where did you get obsessed from? Uh, just from the, the tone of, of the reports. Okay. Is there anything about the media coverage that you saw uh, or witnessed that would prevent you from being a fair and impartial juror in this case? No. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Morgan. Thank you. You're welcome.
Chairman sure, Number 70, I just have a few follow-up questions. Do you supervise the crews that are doing the renovations, sir? Yes, sir. And you were there this morning checking on their work? Yes. And assuming that we go to five, you can check on their work this evening? Yes. Would you be able to do that and still keep the work going as long as you were able to check in the morning and that the court released us at five every day? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's all the questions I have. Let me ask, and I, and I understand you were stressing the point that if you were here for three weeks, you would lose money. Um, we anticipate keeping a relatively consistent schedule. Uh, my question is, if you were selected, and I understand it's on your mind right now about the financial uh, loss and possible loss of revenue. Would you be so distracted um, that you're here with us, and we just estimated it may take up to three weeks, that uh, you would not be able to listen um, because both sides need you to listen to the evidence that's presented through the course of the trial and give a fair and just verdict? Would you be so distracted because you're sitting in that jury box and you may not want to be here because you're thinking about losing money that you could not focus and concentrate on the evidence? It would be very difficult. I understand. Very difficult. Um, all right. Does the state have any other questions? Um, a brief follow-up. You may. And I'll do the same for the defense. Yes, sir. Can you be a little bit more definitive? You said it would be very, very difficult. Um, does that mean you could focus? Because this is this is a big trial. Yes. That, does that mean you could focus on the facts and the evidence and, and not be distracted, um, and, and your mind not be elsewhere? Elsewhere being what's going on at work. Or does that mean you could focus and put put what's going on at work or what's what's not going on at work aside? I think it would de depend on the length of the trial, however, however it goes, and if my uh, if my workers don't mess something up where I have to actually pay attention to it. My, my customer relationships are through me, mm -hmm. uh, and so my customers expect me to be there um, maintaining, making sure everything happens. I work for some pretty high maintenance people, um, higher end homes and things like that. So. Well, the court indicated the trial would go up to three weeks. It would, it would be very difficult. I, I'm doing estimates right now because I have to keep jobs out in front. Uh, when, when they're done with that. These jobs should be finished in about three or four weeks. But I have to have other jobs lined up so that everybody keeps moving. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Morgan, any additional questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Just follow okay. the instructions of the clerk. Thank you, sir. Yes, 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 sir. Y
someone you know has been through a divorce. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, is that someone close to you? Very close to me. <laughs> me. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, was that a particularly contentious or tough divorce? Did it get ugly? Um, I, I mean, I guess they're all kind of ugly. No, it wasn't particularly contentious. I mean, we didn't go through court or anything. It was, um, it was just uncomfortable. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I understand. Um, I'm looking at question number 28, um, and you're talking about either a friend or a family member that was, um, had a situation in New York, um, where everyone was um, charged in the car and the case was dismissed mm -hmm. uh, for, I believe, it was drug possession? Yep. Okay. Um, the case was dismissed for everybody except for the person who actually possessed the drugs. Except for the person who actually possessed the drugs. Was right. that the person that you were close to or was that someone else? He was a, an, a, an acquaintance. Okay. Um, do, you, do you feel that um, the acquaintance, the person that you knew that was charged in this case, do you feel that that person was treated fairly in this process? in New York? Um, yeah, I mean, he admittedly had what they charged him with, I think. When I think that, you, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I mean, if I so, I mean, I think that's fair. I guess what didn't feel fair is that everybody else in the car was charged, but I guess that's the way the law is, so. Okay. Um, was there anything about that experience that, um, that was related to you um, by, by your friend that was in that car, was there anything about that that would um, affect your ability to um, sit as a fair and impartial juror in this case? No. Right. Do you have any long-standing or um, long-standing hard feelings towards the criminal justice system because of what happened in New York? No. Okay. Fair enough. Um, question number 42 you were asked, do you have any strong feelings or opinions, positive or negative, about the criminal justice system? Um, and you said no strong feelings. Um, what, if any, feelings do you have? Um, I think it, the system usually works. I know there are cases where it doesn't, and I feel like it's the best system available to us, and uh, I guess my feelings are that you just hope it's applied, excuse me, applied fairly, and I think it typically is. Is there any reason you can think of that you would not be able to sit as a fair and impartial juror in this case? No. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clay? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Juror number 44, the incident in which you were in the car mm -hmm. where apparently some drugs were found, how long ago was that? I think it may have been like 92. Okay. How many folks were actually in the car? Um, or maybe five or six. So a number of folks are in the car. Yes. Do you know of your own knowledge where the drugs were actually located? No, I don't. Do you know what the nature of the drugs was? Was it marijuana, cocaine? It was some? cocaine and marijuana. Did anyone at the time of the actual, were you actually arrested? Yes. And did the police attempt to interrogate you or question you? Um, I guess so, yeah. Did you make a statement to the police at that time? Uh, some, yeah, I guess so. And did I you don't... deny ownership of the drugs? Oh, sure, yeah. And did you deny knowledge of the drugs? Yes. To your knowledge, did any of the other occupants of the vehicle at that time actually accept or admit ownership of the drugs? I believe he did. Okay. Did the police, after they got that admission right away, immediately say, good, the rest of you folks can go about your business? No. Okay. So if I understand correctly, why were, were you driving? No. Why was the car pulled over initially? Uh, I think my friend was kind of being a jerk driver. Um, and he got in some kind of cat and mouse game with another car. And then I, I kind of feel like it was the other guys who was doing it. But anyway, he ended up getting pulled over. And then um, for that, and then it was a big fan. He was a musician. Mm -hmm. And he asked, the policeman asked, um, why, what was in the van, why was, you know, what was the van, and he said, well, I'm a musician. And okay. Was there anything about the appearance, uh, did the police search the vehicle? Yes. Did anybody give them consent to search the vehicle, or permission? 
Uh, I, I, I honestly don't know. I assume so. I don't know. Okay. Was there anything about the appearance of any individual that might have led the police to, to some extent, profile a group of folks and say they might have drugs in their car? Long hair or things of that sort, African American, anything? Um, I mean, they were musicians, so I guess if you want to be, I don't, I mean, I don't, Fair it wouldn't be to me, but. Okay. How long did it take before they ultimately dismissed the charges against you? Oh, it's quite a while. Um, months. Okay. There is, I don't know, was this, this was in New York State, right? Mm -hmm. um, were you ever formally charged with either an indictment or an accusation, if you know? I believe so. Okay. Did you actually have to retain an attorney? I didn't. Okay. Uh, did the experience leave a bad taste in your mouth towards the criminal justice system? Um, I mean, at the time, for sure, it didn't. Okay. It didn't feel fair, but I don't think that that I, I, I you know, times. Has it dissipated with the passage of time? Sure. Okay. You indicated in response to one of the questions about um, whether you watch certain kinds of TV shows. Put no, and then in parentheses, no TV. I don't have TV. We you just simply TV. don't watch TV at all. We don't watch TV. Good for you, ma'am. Um, so you know, absolutely. Do you know anything at all about this case? Only a very skeleton. Like I didn't. I wasn't familiar with it. I understand that this is part of a case that was previously tried, but I don't. I don't. I don't even think I was living here at the time. Did you follow the case that was previously tried to any oh, no. extent? No. Okay. Do you have any idea what the outcome of the case that was previously tried was? Yeah, I believe the person was was found guilty, but I actually don't even know that. And what was that person found guilty of, if you know? Well, I think it was a shooting, so, no, I, I mean, I assume it was... It was a homicide, I, murder? I guess, yeah. Okay. Um, prior to coming to court and getting your jury summons, did the name Andrea Snyderman mean anything to you at all? No. Fair enough, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, ma'am. Follow the instructions of the clerk. Thank you. Jeez. Thank you. What's the state's position? I believe you qualified, Your Honor. Defense? I concur. All right, lawyers number 72 is qualified. <laughs> lawyers number uh, 71 um, is here. We'll take that person next. I just need, uh, we're gonna, let's take about five minutes. Let me talk. Five minutes. All right.
system. I think my clients can take it on vacation for 10 days. I mean, I'll take a look at it. Okay. Okay. Is that anyone? No. Is that the same? No. I thought it was going to be 74. Yeah. Do 71 is the one that we're going to do. Okay. 74 is the one. Okay. So you didn't respond to any of the questions that I asked earlier? No, I didn't. All right. Um, I also see that, um, I just want to make sure I'm correct, um, that you don't have any opinions about this case one way or the other. No, I don't. Okay. Um, I also have marked down that you've not seen any media coverage whatsoever on this case? No. Even since last week, I mean, even since Friday, since you filled this out? Well, since Friday, I, I've heard about it, but I haven't watched the news about it. Okay. Um, that's, that's, let's, let's explore that a little bit, all right? All right. Um, you said since Friday you've heard about it. Mm -hmm. um, tell me when you heard about it. Well, I heard my father ask about it, but I don't, I don't know anything about it. Yes, sir, you're back. I'm just going to stand back here a little bit. Right. In number 71, I'm having a difficult time hearing your responses, and the court reporter has to take down what you're saying. Okay. I got I lost. I my with. voice is kind of real. Well, so. I if you could, when you respond, can you talk loud enough so that the gentleman on the, on the back can hear what you're saying? Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Jennings. Your, your, you said your father talked to you about it or said something about it? He asked me what was the name. I told him the name, and he said he heard about it, but that was mostly it. Did he tell you what he heard about it or that he just heard about it? He told me it was a shooting, but I didn't really pay attention to it. Okay. Um, anything else other than your father mentioning that he's heard about the case that, that, that you know about this case? No. Okay. 
Is there any reason you can think of that um, that you cannot be cannot be a fair and impartial juror in this case? No, not at the moment. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'll ask the other lawyer, uh, Mr. Peters, okay. is going to ask some additional questions if he wishes. Man, I've got just a few few questions for you. I understand from your questionnaire that you you live at home with your parents, correct? Yes. Would you um, would you be able to tell your parents that they can't talk to you at, if you're selected as a juror? Not only can you not talk to other folks about it, but your your family or any other friends couldn't talk to you about what they know or think they know about this case or any related case. You'd have to tell them, well, can't can't talk about it. Would you have any problem doing that? No, they know since yesterday. Okay, okay. Now you also indicated that uh, insofar as any conflicts serving in this case, you do not have any and you would be available to serve even if the case lasts as long as we predict now, about three weeks. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And the you have studied nurse in nursing school, but you, you haven't completed that. Is that correct? Yes, I took a semester off of school. Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you follow the instructions of the clerk? Thank you. Thank you. Safe position. Your Honor, she's qualified. Defense. We agree, Your Honor. That is number 71, qualified. questions that either the judge asked or that I asked. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Um, is it also um, correct to state that you have not seen any media coverage? About no, I have not. None at all. I do not watch the news. Okay. Even since you filled out uh, this questionnaire? On yes, the sir. No, <coughs> not at all. In the paper, nothing on the radio, nothing, nothing on the news. Not at all. Um, is there any reason that you can think of that you can't sit as a fair and impartial um, juror in the case? Uh, no, not at all. There's no, no reason. No reason at all? Mm -hmm. Anything that um, I haven't asked you that is pertinent to this case that I should ask you? No, not that I can think of, no. All right. Thank you very much. Come on, second, sir. I'm sorry. Mr. Morgan, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Juror number 73, uh, you live alone, correct? Uh, no, I do not. No, no, no. Okay. On the questionnaire, I asked, did anyone live with you? In well, I live in a, I live in a basement apartment. I'm sorry. A basement that. apartment. Okay. So you, yeah, you but somebody you. lives above me. It's, a, it's, it's family. You don't have roommates who talk about this case? No, not at all. Uh-uh. Okay. No. And on your questionnaire, it says you attend Oak Grove United Methodist Church. We have another juror who responded the same. Did you recognize any other juror? No, I did, no, I did not. Okay. No further questions. Okay. 73, if you could follow the instructions of the clerk. Just say position. All right, That is juror number 73. The next is potential juror street date number 74. You may proceed. Thank you, Judge. 
Juror number 74 on question number nine on the questionnaire, what that you filled out, uh, you indicated that um, you have um, some hearing impairment. Slightly. Slightly. Mm -hmm. um, are you having any problems hearing me now talking to you? No. Have you had any problems um, throughout the process, um, specifically when you came in, um, I believe it was yesterday, um, when we were all asking questions, did you have any problems hearing then? Slightly. Slightly. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe the, the nature of, of your hearing impairment? Um, only if there's um, other noises or sounds that's going on, I may not be able to quite hear exactly what you're saying. Okay, so is it a fair assessment that you have problems focusing on if there are multiple sources of sound at the same time? True. You have problems True. hearing? Then? Yes. Okay. Um, Question number 39, um, you indicated that you would have a problem honoring your oath if you were sworn in as a juror, is that correct? I did. Okay, and can you explain to us uh, why that would be a problem? I just totally felt like it was, I would just have a very strong opinion about um, the case itself. I knew of the case and um, it was, I just have strong opinions about it. When you say you know of the case, um, let's start there and then we'll talk about your opinion. So okay. What do you know of the case? Um, just basically um, what I've seen on um, television, discussed with co-workers, that kind of thing. Okay. What have you seen on television? Let's start there. As far as the um, murder itself, as far as the um, husband being shot, um, as far as the the other person that she was supposed to be involved with and that kind of na the nature of those things. Okay. Um, and what did you discuss with coworkers? Mm, just idle opinions of who feels that that person is guilty, who feels that, you know. You all took a straw poll? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, how did you vote? I voted, um, my opinion was that I wasn't there, mm -hmm. so I really don't know, okay. but I f also felt that it might, it, she might have had a, a hand in it. That's what I said. Okay. Now, I know how you've responded here, and I know what you just told me. I'm sort of follow up on that by asking you this question. You understand that in a trial, mm -hmm. right, judges are gonna instruct you that you have to set aside all of those separate judgments and all of those uh, opinions or gut feelings that you may have coming in and make your decision based on the facts and the evidence that is presented to you and the testimony that comes from the witness stand. Do you understand that? I do. All right. Um, would you be able to set aside uh, those conversations that you've had and the media coverage that you've seen and make an opinion based on what is presented to you? Honestly, no. Okay. And that's a fixed opinion that you have? It is my opinion. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. No questions, Mr. Young. Okay, thank you. You may call the special clerk. Thank you. Thank you. State's position. Your Honor, I believe she should uh, be excused for cause. Defense, we can carry on. Seventy-four recalls. Make the final agreement. I will accept that agreement. Juror number seventy-five should be next. Thank you, Your Honor. Juror 75, you told us yesterday that you could potentially have a conflict if you yes. were selected to serve as a juror in this case. Yes. Would you uh, elaborate for us on what that conflict is and speak up for me? Yes, I'm a student at Albany State University. And right now I'm working actually to save my money because I was told that I have to pay my tuition out of pocket. So every day that I'm missing from work is money that could potentially go to my tuition for next semester. Are you a full or part-time student? I'm a full-time student. 
When do classes resume? It should. It's supposed to resume on August, the, I believe, the 11th for this semester. But since this conflict, I'm going to wait to January to go back. Okay. So you are actually. So you delayed your decision already to not resume school until January. Yes, because I've missed since Friday. I've missed today. Friday and Monday, so that's like six hundred dollars that's been taken out of my pocket that could have went to my tuition. Go ahead. Uh, was it the, the fact that you missed work for the three days that caused you to delay going yes. back to school, or had you already made that decision? And I, I made plans actually because I like when I started my work, I went ahead and calculated to make sure that I would actually have enough money throughout these months to pay my tuition in the full by me missing these three days that's like six hundred dollars again that I'm going to be short for my tuition for this month. So there's no way you can make that up? No, I'm an independent student so I really don't have anyone that I can rely on to let me borrow money or anything like that. Um, so it, since you're going back in, in January, yes. what hours do you work? Um, from, to help save money for from 7 a.m. until 5 o'clock, and every now and then they give me overtime on Friday or Saturday. Where do you work? From Pilgrim's Met Service in Tucker, Georgia. Okay. And are you paid hourly? Yes. Have you spoken with them about their policy regarding jury service? Do you know whether or not they may pay you? For I honestly don't know. They told me that to just bring in my receipt from here once I've been released and they would let me know if they would be able to pay me or not. But up until this point, they haven't told me for sure that they would actually pay me for the days that I've missed. Have you brought your, the paperwork in yet? Uh, yes, I mean, I showed them, I guess, the summons for it, but. I mean, I can't get any paperwork from here until I'm released. That's what I'm being told. Okay, so let me let me ask you this. If you were to get paperwork from the court showing that you've been here for the last three days, um, is that something, are you telling me that the job may consider paying you for those three days? They would, but I, that's something I would probably have to go and ask in debt a little bit more because I didn't really just ask for sure would I be getting paid for the days that I missed. So, so the fact that you, you, you're saying you didn't get paid, you're assuming they won't pay you. They yes. haven't officially told you that yet. Yes. <clears throat> if by chance you get paperwork from the court showing your attendance and your job decides that they will pay you for those three days, uh, will that affect whether or not you go to school in August? Or are you at this point set on going in, in January? I've already, I'm set. I pushed my, um, you know, my leasing information back up until January. So it's okay. already set that I'm going in January. Okay. So if, um, if you were working, excuse me, if you, were, if you get selected to serve as a juror on this case, the fact that you are missing work, tell us how that would affect your ability to concentrate on the evidence while it's being presented? I mean, I would really think about the money that I could be making that could make my life easier in Albany. You know, I could definitely save more money by being at work versus being here. Would those thoughts preoccupy you so much that you would not be able to pay attention to what's going on in court? Or are those thoughts that you would obviously have in the back of your mind, but you can sort of put them aside and pay attention to I mean, I would have it in the back of my mind, and I could feel myself being irritated at times when, because I'm thinking about, well, again, me missing work being here. Okay. And the irritation, it, would it affect you to the point that you believe you would not be able to be fair and impartial? Yes, you most definitely. Okay. Mr. Clay, um, no, I have no question. All right. Thank you. Number 75, would you follow instructions? Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. What's next position? Here I am, we believe, uh, juror number 75. Uh,
we would make a motion that he be excused for cause based on the fact that he is, well, he would not be able to be a fair and impartial vote based on his own work. He would be preoccupied with the fact that he's missing money and it's affecting his ability to uh, earn money so that he can pay and, and matriculate back in school. I'll say pass the session. We concur in the state's motion and are enjoying it. All right, lawyers, I will accept that recommendation and We will list the calls. Next person, next person, number 76, Williams. Steve You told us yesterday um, that you have seen some, seen or heard some press coverage regarding this case since completing your questionnaire. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And if you would just tell us what you saw or heard. Um, mostly about the jury selection and things that I was already aware of okay. during the Newman case. So. So tell me what you were already aware of regarding the Newman case. Um, his conviction that uh, he was mental while he did what he did. Uh, I feel like Ms. Snyderman was involved in it, so. And From what I've heard over media. That was actually going to be my question. The opinion that you formed was based on what you've heard in the media. Is that yes. Right? Now let me ask you, do you, do you understand and appreciate the difference between what's recorded in the media and what may actually be presented in court? Um, the, the distinction between the two. Yes, I do. I don't know that I could change my opinion in it, though. Okay. Um, and you don't know that you could change your opinion because it's it's firmly fixed or deeply rooted, so to speak? I believe so because of how much I followed the Newman case. I don't think that I could forget some of the things that when it's brought up again, mm -hmm. I think that it's already implanted within me, so. so coming in with your current opinion. Mm -hmm. If you heard something from the witness stand that was in conflict with what you already believe you know, um, which would you go with? with? Which version would you go with? What you've heard in court or what you believe you know from the media? And let me just back up and preface that by saying that you are Right. right. I object to the questions. I assume the jury to prejudge the case based on that issue is not heard and try to resolve that. That's an improper question. I'm going to stay that way. I'm going to stay that way. I'm going to stay that way. Okay. Let me strike that. Okay. And ask you if you were selected as a juror mm -hmm. and given instructions by the court to, to consider the law and the evidence as it's presented in court. And the evidence you understand would come from the witness stand mm -hmm. or perhaps through documentations that, that you're given, documents that you're given. Would you be able to listen to the evidence as it's presented in court and consider that when reaching a verdict? Or do you believe that what you've heard in the media would influence your ability to consider the evidence as it's presented in court? I believe that I would have to, they would present a battle within me to weigh it. And I would have to take other things that I had heard in consideration to hear new evidence or to hear evidence that contradicts what I've already heard. I don't know which one I would go with. 
I mean, I, I might hang a jury <laughs> trying to decide. Okay. All right. um, so, so if I understand you correctly, the opinion that you have would be one that you would carry with you if you're selected as a juror on this case. I believe so. And that opinion uh, is fixed enough in your mind that no matter what you hear in the courtroom, that uh, your opinion would sway or could sway your decision in the jury room. I believe so. Okay. Fair enough. Good morning. Just one second after supplement. Are you back? And good morning, everyone. I'm Jeff Hellinger. Welcome to our continuing coverage of the jury selection in the Andrea Snyderman trial. As we continue here into third day, 40 jurors are now in the pool, and this has moved along very, very swiftly. There was the anticipation that it would take until Thursday at 1.30. Judge Adams had decreed that yesterday morning. But at the sort of pace that they are rolling uh, through right now, it appears that uh, all of this will certainly be in line and, and done before then. The expectation is the evidence part of this trial will proceed on Monday morning. So uh, in all probability, uh, once we get down to the 12 jurors and the three alternates, uh, this uh, let these sirens pass by outside the DeKalb County Courthouse, which is where we are right now. Uh, again, the expectation is this trial will occur on Monday. So let's go back into the courtroom. We'll keep you updated all day, uh, not only here with the live streaming, but also we will have you covered on 11 Alive News coming up at 6 at 7, uh, the rundown at 10 on WATL and 11 Alive News at 11 p.m. That's correct. All right. Tell us about please, your conflict, please. Well, um, yesterday my mother, <coughs> excuse me, my mother had surgery. And I was in Brunswick, and that's five hours away from here, the day before. And they was getting her, re preparing her for surgery. And this was a long coming thing when I got the um, summons from the um, mail back. And it was already going on. And yesterday she had her surgery. And it really is a conflict because I won't be able to actually sit and concentrate because she's 74 years old. Uh, and you say she's in Brunswick? Brunswick, Georgia. Mm -hmm. So what are your plans if you are not selected to serve as a What are your plans regarding your mother? Would you stay here in the Atlanta area or would you go down to Brunswick? I'm going to Brunswick to be with her. Do you have any siblings that could also uh, be with her? Yes, my brother, he is there right now. And he has to, he's work, he works at the airport and he has to get back to work. Okay. Have you already arrang made arrangements to be down there with her? Well, you, it just depends on, you know, I knew I had to be here. Mm -hmm. And um, as soon as I leave from here, I already notified my job that, I'm, you know, I'm going, I'm leaving. And, and that's what I meant, through, yes. through work, you've, you've made the arrangements. Yes. How long do you plan to be down with your mom? Well, until she's at the hospital. The doctor already said that she will be in the hospital a week. Okay, so she'll be in the hospital for at least a week. Mm -hmm. And then um, there will be a recovery period at home? Yes, uh-huh. Do you intend to stay in Brunswick with her during the recovery period as well? No, I can't afford it <laughs> to come back. Okay. Uh, so when... When, if you know right now, did you plan to be back in the Atlanta area? Well, as of yesterday, I notified my job because I'm part-time there. If I'm not at work, I do not get paid. Okay. And I notified them that I need at least a week off. And that was as of yesterday? Yes. Next Tuesday. So you're, you're going to be out of work at least until next Tuesday? Yes. So if this trial were to start on Monday the 5th, um, you would still be in Brunswick or just coming back from Brunswick? I'll just be coming back and then I have artistic son. Mm -hmm. 
right. that I have that on, I have that also listed that you do? yes right now he's with his grandmother because of my mother illness he's with his other grandmother mm -hmm. and I, I have full custody over him I take care of my son he's 16 and he lives with me and his grandmother's 82, so I don't usually really leave him with her, but I didn't have a choice. Okay, all right. So uh, the fact that you, your mother would be still recovering from surgery, um, the fact that you could potentially miss work, what hours do you work? I work from 7.30 until 12.15. 7.30 a.m. or p.m.? A.m. <clears throat> Okay, so if uh, you were here during your work hours, that would be an issue concerning you, is that correct? If I was here? Yes. Yes. And not working? It, yes. And if you don't get paid, how does that affect you? It, it affects me a lot because I solely depend on this income that I just started getting. and. Um, and, and like I say, I'm part-time, and if I'm not there, like now, I'm not getting paid. Okay. And you, you mentioned your son. Yes. Who has autism. What, uh, on a daily basis, what is it other than, you know, your normal responsibilities, what extra attention do you have to give him because of the fact that he's autistic. Okay, first of all, I have to, my daughter, I have a daughter, she's in college. Okay. And it worked out that she was home. But she has to be back to school in August. And when you say it worked out that she was home, do you mean while you were here? Yeah. Yes, while I was here. Okay. And she just, when I went to Brunswick to see about my mom, she went there too, because she had to check on her, you know, school. And she was able to be with my son, you know, and help her grandmother with him because like I say, she's 82. And I was gonna use her to, for the summer to watch because I do have to pay someone for watching him. And you know that also, you know, money. Right. Okay, may, may I have one? one? You're right. Any more questions? No questions, John, thank you very much. Thank you. If you could follow the steps of the foot. Thank you very much, number 77. And good morning, everyone. Again, I'm Jeff Hellinger. We continue to watch the Snyderman trial, the jury selection, as there are now 40 in the pool right now. And uh, there has been almost 300 from a jury pool right now. Andrea Snyderman, of course, not facing murder charges as they were dropped last Friday, but she is still facing 13 felony counts. That's seven charges of perjury, four charges of making false statements, one count each of hindering the apprehension of a criminal and concealing a material fact in the connection with the death of her husband, Rusty, in November of 2010. The maximum sentence for each of these counts will range from five to ten years in prison. So again, we are continuing to watch uh, the attorneys and Judge Gregory A. Adams here in DeKalb Superior Court as they are motoring through this pool. The expectation has been that uh, it would take until Thursday at 1.30, but it looks as though uh, it certainly is going to move along faster than that. We're now seeing the attorneys being called to the bench where Judge Adams will relay his instructions to them. We are once again hearing from prospective jurors as they are questioned and it is sort of a familiar refrain that we have heard over the course of the last couple of days and that is you know a lot of people don't want to sit on a jury like this. This is a trial that has generated a lot of attention, of course, and uh, the expectation is that a trial uh, of this kind will take about three weeks beginning on Monday. So that is a tremendous amount of personal sacrifice and professional sacrifice. One of the jurors said that already uh, she has been impacted by about six, seven hundred dollars as she's trying to save money to be able to go to college. 
and that if she were to be part of this jury, that it would uh, sadly continue for her uh, sort of her financial destruction, and it's something she can't seemingly afford to do at this point. Uh, we are also hearing from some jurors this morning who had talked about being familiar with this case. Um, one woman said uh, she wasn't sure where she stood on either the guilt or the innocence of Andrea Snyderman. And uh, she was then questioned by both sides about whether she could remain impartial through all of this. Uh, yesterday I talked with Bill Morrison, the criminal defense attorney who has been a part of so many big trials in North Georgia over the the last few years and I had asked him the question if you know attorneys like to say they are looking for fair and impartial jurors is that really true and and he smiled and he said well it depends on their perspective of what their definition is of, of impartial so certainly everybody comes into this with a bent about what they are trying to get uh, whether it's the prosecution or it is uh, the client, Andrea Snyderman, in this case. Andrea Snyderman this morning is sitting passively. Yesterday was uh, more animated, more uh, at, at times really buoyant as far as her attitude went uh, in the courtroom. But uh, this morning she has been somewhat quiet, somewhat tepid. She is uh, sitting in a, a pink sweater with her hair pulled back and is sitting flanked by her three attorneys this morning. So. We are uh, sitting almost uh, 10 after 10 o'clock. This began around 9 this morning. And the way it has played out over the last couple of days, uh, a lunch break generally comes up around 12.30, and then they will break for about an hour and then go at it once again. So the jury pool right now is uh, sitting at 39. And again, the uh, attorneys are now making their way toward Gregory A. Adams here as they are hearing more of his instructions. Again, those murder charges were dropped on Friday, and that certainly has been a point of contention for uh, some of the national interest, at least from the media, has waned somewhat uh, in terms of those outside of Atlanta Metro, while here in Atlanta Metro, newspaper, radio, and television coverage remains uh, very strong. But with those murder charges being dropped, it has changed somewhat of the public dynamic of it. And again, she is facing these 13 felony counts. There was some speculation last week that perhaps a plea bargain could be reached. There was an attempt to do so. There has been some speculation that she was offered one year in prison, which she rejected, choosing instead to go to court and, and uh, trying to exoner exonerate herself of these 13 felony counts. Seven charges of perjury, four charges of making false statements, and one count each of hindering the apprehension of a criminal and conce uh, concealing a material fact in connection with the death of Rusty Snyderman in November of 2010. But uh, it has been uh, a very quiet morning so far, and again, we are about an hour into it. We'll have to see how long this proceeds today. And of course, culled from this jury pool of 39 will be 12 jurors and three alternates. So. Uh, the judge has moved very, very swiftly through all of this. And again, that, that target date of Thursday at 1.30 in the afternoon uh, to have all of this accomplished seems like it will be done prior to that. So we continue to have plenty of coverage for you that we are streaming here online, and we will do so during the duration of this trial, which again is expected to go through most of the month of August. Uh, we are also uh, on our digital television channel, uh, that you can see this coverage. And we will have you covered, of course, uh, on our news coming up at noon. Uh, the Ted Hall will be anchoring uh, in a little less than two hours, then at 6 o'clock tonight. And then at 7 o'clock, Brenda Wood's show uh, will be with Judge Glenda Hatchett, who has a very strong resume of the judicial here in Atlanta Metro and, of course, has had a very successful judge show and syndication that has gone on for at least a decade and continues to do so in reruns and very very successful she is uh, a very adept at discussing such issues and is giving us some thoughts and observations uh, that give us a new insight into all of this also i have uh, been having a, a uh, attorney with me as well a criminal defense 
attorney to discuss the developments as well with Judge Hatchett and Brenda. Yesterday we had Bill Morrison, who has been such a, a well-known attorney in North Georgia over the decades. Had Stephen Byrne with me on Monday, who also has been uh, in this area about 30 years. Both of them are Emory attorneys and were able to give a unique perspective of Atlanta and a, a sense of history of these high-profile cases of which both of them have been involved. So now we have the attorneys sitting down again, and we are preparing to begin once again to uh, take a look at the jury pool here and try to get toward those 12 jurors and three alternates. Bring them in. Come on in, ladies and gentlemen, have a seat. Um, let's sit in sequential order. And one person has to sit on the second one. You can sit right here, young lady. That's on the second one. Lawyers, you may be seated. All right, Kelly, we are on the record. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience and your understanding. Uh, this is an ongoing process. I know you originally came to the building on last Friday, fill out questionnaires. I know you um, came yesterday and you've been very patient and understanding, and I appreciate that. I'm going to need your patience a little bit more because we still are going through this process of questioning individuals. Uh, at this point in time, no one has been quote unquote selected for the jury. We're just narrowing down who, and I'm going to give some instructions momentarily, and uh, some of you will have the opportunity to spend some additional time with me. You're going to come back and see me tomorrow afternoon at 1.30. But I'm not going to identify the numbers yet. Let me give you these instructions. You'll be given a letter momentarily, and those individuals who receive this letter will report back tomorrow at 1.30 so that we can actually select, I anticipate you right now, I believe we'll be able to select the jury at 1.30 tomorrow, okay? And as of tomorrow, those individuals will be known, it'll be known to those individuals who will be with us. And it's projecting out, um, I anticipate opening statements will start on Monday, and the case will project out um, at the most three weeks. Maybe less than that, but I, I just have to give an outer limit, okay? Now, for those of you who, uh, who will be identified, do not discuss the case. I'll allow them to discuss the case with you. And I know the lawyers alluded to this on a couple of, when you uh, go home, obviously uh, people want to talk to you, which is okay. You have spouses, significant others, children and loved ones who want to talk. This time you're, you, you're on the jury for right now, but don't go into the details and don't discuss any possible facts. I'll allow them to discuss facts with you. Once I release you from this process, I'm going to go ahead and let you leave the building, all of you. Um, at this point in time, once I get to that particular point. Because I want you to hear anything you should not hear, hear it, you should not interact with. Uh, those individuals who receive this letter do not read or look at any media coverage pertaining to this case, do not go upon the internet and do any research about this case, do not blog about this case while it is ongoing, do not go to any location that may or may not have been made reference to, um, do not do any independent investigation. Uh, do not discuss the case, as I said earlier, or allow anyone to discuss the case with you. Do not Google anybody or anything of that nature. I can, uh, and try to and not let anyone communicate with you on any level. Uh, all the evidence must come to you in the form of sworn testimony that comes in through the witness stand and, out, and or any physical evidence that is introduced during the course of the trial. Uh, when you come back on Thursday for those individuals who get this letter, you want to welcome and bring something to snack with you uh, and drink um, um, during the afternoon breaks or during the breaks. Do not consume uh, any alcoholic beverages during lunch um, because you'll be coming here immediately after a possible lunch break. But do not consume any alcoholic beverages during lunch. You're more than welcome to check your cell phones, iPhones, and communication devices. Um, but just don't communicate with anyone uh, with those devices about this case or express an opinion or anything of that nature. As I indicated earlier, uh, the lawyers and the parties cannot talk and interact with you. So if you see them out and about uh, even between now and Thursday, I don't ever want you to think of being rude or discourteous. It's just that they cannot talk with you outside of the presence of the court. Now, when you come back on Thursday, you can be early, but you cannot be late because I just need everyone to assemble so that we can proceed in this process. Again, let me thank each and every one of you for taking out the time. And I know uh, it's been a challenge on some levels in coming in and participating in this process, but this is how uh, this process works all across the country. We ask citizens to set aside their affairs and come in and listen to the evidence. All right. With that said, Jay is going to give you some instructions. Now, 
Also, um, once you get your letter, I'm going to let you, you're going to be able to remove the numbers and the blue badges because once you leave, I don't want anyone to interact with you or think that you may be on a juror or wasn't a juror and try to talk with you. And if anyone tries to approach you and interact with you that you deem to be inappropriate, just report it to one of my deputies or bailiffs or you know, someone in, uh, on my staff and we'll deal with that separately, okay? Any questions about logistics? One more, hearing none. And any communication that you have to make with the court, they have to be in written communication, and I will confer with the lawyers and we'll give you a response. All right, I'll turn it over to Jay at this point in time. You may proceed. When I call your number, I will be giving you a letter that states you are hereby ordered by the Honorable Judge Gregory Adams that you are to appear Thursday, August 1st at 1.30 p.m. to courtroom 5B on the fifth floor. Juror number 71. Juror number 72 and juror number 73. All right. Lawyers, uh, do those indications, are they consistent with your notes? State? Yes, Your Honor. Defense? Yes, Your Honor. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the three of you have received your documentation. You will be back with me on Thursday. Now, everyone can remove the blue badges and the numbers and just, you just take them off and the numbers and fold them in half and pass them all the way down. Now, those individuals are coming back on Thursday. We're going to give you, we're going to have the same number, but we're going to give them to you new again. I just don't need you going outside the building with your number because I'm trying as best I can, trying to um, limit your exposure. All right, any questions on this? Wonderful, hearing none. You can just follow Jay, you can let, uh, let them leave through that time, Jay. Right. Just follow the instructions of the clerk. Thank you. I'll see some of you back on Thursday. Thank you on behalf of the system. Have a good day. See you soon. Bye. Bye. purpose of this. Uh, it should you know, bring the next panel. Uh, Mr. Deputy, uh, uh, we will give them their numbers at the appropriate time um, because I have to go through the general. What I'm going to do uh, is not that many individuals, but put as many of them in the jury box in uh, I mean, consecutive order. And then once you go from left, yes, from left to right, and once you complete that, then we will use the first row and the second row, and this is going to be to my left. Uh, no one is going to, uh, I just need people to shift to the other side, but the doors will remain open and the courtroom will full access. I think we shift over so those potential members can um, have a seat. Yes, um, it'll be a brief recess, lawyers. Let me give you, because I know I, I don't believe I've given the lawyers a morning break. Uh, lawyers, let me go ahead and give you a, um, and this is for the purpose of the meeting, uh, we will not uh, resume prior to uh, 12 minutes from now, okay? So you have at least a 12 minute break. All right. All right. All right, welcome back everyone. I'm Jeff Hullinger outside the DeKalb Courthouse. We are taking...
you know, sitting there, you don't want to know which, which side is on. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, you're not going to have access. Oh, I know. I know that. I'm talking about 
have you ever seen one of these example you
Buckles. Which you want to come through there or the back? It's up to you. You just tell me. You can do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this.
And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeff Holland. For your Snyderman trial. With me is Attorney Jamila Hall, and we appreciate you being here today, giving some of your observations, thoughts, and musings on all that is uh, transpiring today. We've been in the midst of a very long break. 37 jurors are believed to have been selected at this point. We need three more. One wave has been dismissed. Another wave is coming in. That's correct. I think they're about to bring in the next wave now. And from that, we hope that they'll get the remaining three jurors, at which point we'll go um, back and probably tomorrow go through the, the set of 40 that they have to will it down to the 15. What is the anticipation as to what we can expect for the remainder of the afternoon? Is this going to go on for three to four hours or could it end 
as rapidly as maybe 45 minutes. They've been moving fairly quickly, and so I can imagine that this could go fairly quickly now. They have an understanding of what they're looking for in their jurors, and they know what types of questions they want to ask. And so now I think you'll see the process move faster than it has. All right, so they have 37. They want 40, maybe 41 before they begin the selection of 12 with three alternates. So uh, that is the timetable that Judge Adams has set for Thursday at 1.30, to have all this on the table. There then is the belief that Friday will be a, a quiet day and Monday uh, it would resume. Yes, then on Monday we'll start with opening statements. That will have the jury seated, the alternate seated, and the case will then proceed from there. What's your take on what you have seen over the last 24 hours? Any much how it always plays out for prosecution and defense attorneys? I think what surprises me the most is some of the jurors that have actually been selected to be on the panel. Uh, yesterday there was a juror who was discussing a similar experience he had to Ms. Snyderman, uh, basically talking about the fact that he had these charges pending over him for a year and they were dropped very close to the time of trial. I, I was very surprised that he was kept on the panel as it seems that he, per he particularly has a bias um, against the justice system, but perhaps he'll be impartial, we'll see. As a defense attorney, if you were involved in this case, would, would you have a certain sort of juror in mind if you were representing Andrea Snyderman that would be at least more sympathetic to what is going on from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I think what you're looking for is somebody that's uh, hardworking, somebody that's very critical uh, thinker. So you're looking for some, perhaps many professional people so that they can really dissect what you're saying. A lot, a lot of what the defense is going to be here is drawing logical c conclusions and trying to tear apart pieces of the prosecution's case by just pointing little bitty holes in that. And so you need somebody that's going to be very perceptive. Uh, and you want somebody that already appears to be open to looking and considering that type of evidence. All right, Jamila Hall, let's go back now into the courtroom. And this is Judge Gregory A. Adams. State of Georgia, on or about the 24th day of November 2010, did normally and willfully conceal from representatives of the Dunwoody Police Department the existence of a romantic relationship between herself and Henry Newman while that department was conducting an official investigation into the murder of Russell Snyderman. Count three charges and accused Andrew Snyderman with the offense of making a false statement in matters within the jurisdiction of the Dunwoody Police Department in violation of the official code of Georgia 161020 for the said accused person in the county of the cab, state of Georgia, on or about the fifth day of January 2011 did knowingly and willfully make a false statement in a matter within the jurisdiction of the Dunwoody Police Department to wit accused told Lieutenant D. Barnes and Deputy Chief D. Size that she never suspected that Hemi Newman was involved in the murder of Russell Snyman prior to December 28, 2010. Count four charges and accused Andrew Snyman with the offense of perjury in violation of official code of Georgia 161070 for the said accused person in the county of the cab, state of Jordan, on or about the 21st day of February 2012, having been given a lawful oath in a judicial proceeding, State versus Henry Newman, 11 CR 1364, did make a false statement in a judicial proceeding, in a judicial, judicial proceeding material to a point in question to wit that she did not have knowledge that Russell Steinman had been shot at the time she spoke to Donald Steinman prior to her arrival at Dunwoody Prep, such statement being material to the issue surrounding the murder of Russell Steinman. Count five charges and accuses Andrew Snyderman with the offense of making a false statement in matters within his jurisdiction of the Dunwoody Police Department in violation of official code of Georgia 161020 for the said accused person in the county of the Cap State of Georgia on or about the fifth day of January 2011 did knowingly and willfully make a false statement in a matter within the jurisdiction of the Dunwoody Police Department to wit accused told Lieutenant D. Barnes and Deputy Chief D. Sides that she did not know what had happened to Russell Snyderman at the time she had arrived at Dunwoody Prep, when in fact she knew that Russell Snyderman had been shot prior to her arrival at Dunwoody Prep. Count six charges and accused Andrew Snyderman with the offense of perjury in a violation of official code of Georgia 161070 for the said accused person in the county of the Cab, state of Georgia, on or about the 21st day of February 2012, having been given a lawful oath in a judicial proceeding, State v. Henry Newman, 11 CR 1364, did make a false statement in a judicial proceeding, material to a point in question to wit that she was not romantically involved with Henry Newman, such statement being material to the issues surrounding murder of Russell Snyder. 
count seven charges and accuses Andrew Snyder with defense of perjury and violation of official code of Georgia 161070 for the said accused person in the county of the Cavs, state of Georgia, on or about the 21st day of February 2012, having been given a lawful oath in a judicial proceeding, State versus Henry Newman, 11 CR 1364, did make a false statement in a judicial proceeding material to a point in question to it that none of Henry Newman's feelings for her were ever returned, such statement being material to the issues surrounding murder of Russell Snyderman. Count eight charges and accuses Edgar Snyderman with the offense of false statement and matters within the jurisdiction of the Demonwood Police Department in violation of official code of Georgia 161020 for the said accused person in the county of the Cab, state of Georgia, on or about the 19th day of November 2010, did knowingly and willfully make a false statement during an official investigation into the murder of Russell Snyderman to wit, she told Detective A. Thompson that she had made it clear to Henry Newman that she did not want him to pursue her romantically. Count nine charges and accuses Andrew Snyderman with defense of perjury in violation of official code of Georgia 161070 for the said accused person in the county of the Cavs, state of Georgia, on or about the 21st day of February 2012, having been given a lawful oath in a judicial proceeding, State versus Henry Newman, 11 CR 1364, did make a false statement in a judicial proceeding material to a point in question to wit that she did not share a hotel room with Henry Newman in Longmont, Colorado, such statement being material to the issue surrounding the murder of Russell Snyderman. Count 10 charges and accuses Andrew Snyderman with the offense of false statements and matters within the jurisdiction of the Dunwoody Police Department in violation of official code of Georgia 161020 for the said accused person in the county of the Cab, state of Georgia, on or about the 5th day of January 2011, did knowingly and willfully make a false statement to Lieutenant D. Barnes and Deputy Chief D. Size to where she denied that Hemi Newman was in Longmont, Colorado in July 2010 with accused. Count 11, charges and accused Andrew Snyder with defensive perjury in violation of official code of Georgia 161070 for the said accused person in the county of the Cab, state of Georgia, on or about the 21st day of February 2012, having been uh, given a lawful oath in a judicial proceeding, State versus Henry Newman, 11 0 1364 did make a false statement in a judicial proceeding material to a point in question to it that at the time she was in Longmont, Colorado with Henry Newman, she believed he was there on business for General Electric, such statement being material to the issue surrounding the murder of Russell Snyder. Count 12, charges and accuses uh, Andrew Snyder with defensive perjury in violation of official code of Georgia 161070 for the said accused person in the county of the Cab, state of Georgia, on or about the 21st day of February 2012, having been given a lawful oath in a judicial proceeding, State v. Henry Newman, 11 CR 1364, did make a false statement in a judicial proceeding material to a point in question to it that she and Henry Newman did not kiss while in Greenville, South Carolina, such statement being material to the issue surrounding the murder of Russell Snyder. Count 13 charges and accuses Andrew Snyderman with the offense of perjury in violation of official code of Georgia 161070 for the said accused person in the county of the Cab State of Georgia on or about the 21st day of February 2012, uh, having been given a lawful open and judicial proceeding, State versus Henry Newman, 11 CR 1364. Would you secure that form, Mr. Deputy, for me? Did make a false statement in a judicial uh, proceeding material to a point in question to where the accused testified that it was due to her mother Bonnie Greenberg's concern for the accused's safety that she did not immediately report her suspicions of Henry Newman's involvement in the murder of Russell Snyderman to the Dunwoody Police Department, such statement being material to the issues surrounding the murder of Russell Snyderman. Contrary to the laws of the state, good old peace, dignity, they're all signed by the James, this returning. So all of these charges, as I indicated, Mrs. Snyderman, Andrew Snyderman has entered the plea of not guilty and she is presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty in a court of law. And you will have this indictment out with you at the appropriate time. Ladies and gentlemen, I once, uh, and we've been doing this for several days, this is called board dial, which is a jury selection process. Once the jury is actually selected and impound, uh, will come opening statements. After the opening statements, the presentation of evidence, closing arguments, charge, and deliberation. I have, before we can continue, those who are here um, for jury service, I need you to stand, please, so I can give you an oath. <coughs> and if each, were, each of you would raise, if you can stand, if each of you would raise your right hands, please. You shall give true answers to all questions as may be asked by the court or its authority, including all questions asked by the parties or their attorneys 
concerning your qualifications as jurors in the case of the state versus Andrew Steinman. So help you God, if you will say I will. I will. Well, you may lower your hand and you may be seated. And ladies and gentlemen, I will be asking a series of general questions at this point in time. And the deputies and or the uh, clerk, the jury management have given you placards to raise your particular numbers. Uh, if you respond affirmatively to any of these particular questions, the lawyers will have an opportunity to ask individual questions at the appropriate time and they will follow up. So if you want to respond to any of these questions that I pose or the lawyers at the appropriate time, just raise those placards and um, they will follow up at the appropriate time. Have you, for any reason, formed or expressed any opinion in regard to the guilt or innocence of the accused? The accused is Mrs. Sniper. Anyone on the first row? Anyone on the second row? First row in the gallery. All right. Have you any prejudice or bias resting on your mind either for or against the accused? Did I, I'm sorry. Did you say Oh, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't see your placard. I apologize. If, that, if you don't, all right, see, I'm looking for the motion too. So 96, let me just repeat the question. First question is, have you, for any reason, formed or expressed any opinion in regard to the guilt or the innocence of the accused? That's Mr. Snyder. First row. Okay. okay. When I when you raise the numbers, keep them up, because I'm going to call them out loud so the lawyers can make a uh, notation, okay? Number 59, 78. When I call the number, you can look. Okay. 59, 78, 79, 83. Second, no, no, no. Just, no, no. Just raise the flag. Okay? That's all you're doing right now. Just raise the flag. Yeah, the, the question is still, I don't understand the question. Okay. Let me, let me, that's fine. Let me rephrase. I apologize. I will try it again. As you sit here today, the only thing you've heard in this case, uh, I've read the indictment and you've heard the lawyers introduce themselves and Mrs. Simon has introduced herself. Have you, for any reason, form or express an opinion in regards to the guilt or innocence of the accused. That says what you know right now. That's all. Any that time in your life, right? Right. Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. So, with that said, now broken. Any time in your life, have you, for any reason, form or express any opinion in regard to the guilt or innocence of the accused? That is Andrew Snyder. Any time in your life. All right. Great. Number 59, and the Lord's going to do follow up. Number 78. Number Have you any prejudice or bias resting on your mind either for or against the accused? First row, number 59. Anyone else on the second row? perfectly impartial between the state of Georgia and the accused, that is Mrs. Snyderman, and if your answer is no, that you, at this point in time your mind is not perfectly impartial between the state and the accused, if your answer is no, you can raise your number. No one on the first row. Second row. Third row. All right. There were no responses to that question. Are you, or do you think you are, Related by blood or marriage to the accused. I, 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 in this, pertain to any time in your life. Do you think you relate to it? Okay. What about the history of man? I understand. <laughs> and like I said, the lawyers, the, right now, the lawyers going to be individual questions and you're going to be able to follow up. I understand. Just a couple uh, generations. No, no, I understand. Just, all, all I need people to do right now, to the best of their ability, just raise your plaque. Okay, anybody, we're going to do individual questions at the appropriate time. All I can do is ask the question the best I can. Are you related by, by blood or marriage to the accused? If you think you are, just raise the flag. On the first row, second row, first row in the gallery. Are you, or do you believe that you may be related to the victim in this case, Russell Snyder? First row. Second row. First row in the gallery. Are you, or do you believe that you may be related by blood or marriage to, uh, and that's one of the names in the indictment, Mr. Henry Newman. Are you related by blood or marriage to Mr. Henry Newman? First row. Second row. First row in the gallery. I will continue reading names that have been made reference in the indictment. Do you believe that you are related by blood of marriage to Lieutenant D. Barnes? First row, 
And, he, and this individual may be with, at least at that time, the Dunwoody Police Department. Lieutenant D. Barnes, first row, second row. First row, on the gap. Right. Do you believe you're related by blood of marriage to Chief D. Size? First row, 